My name is Tom Klein. I've been in recovery since 831.05 and it's been a wonderful journey. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for coming out and joining us. Could you start off by sharing a bit about your um, childhood, those early years growing up? What was what was life like for you? Oh, life was good. I mean, I look back and uh, realize I was off to a pretty good start in life before the alcohol took over. Uh, outgoing kid, played sports, you know, did well in school, had a lot of friends and just uh, hung out at the pool or in the woods and, you know, the generation where we were outside playing all the time, right, where the folks had to call you in and just lived in a really good neighborhood. Um, and when was the first time that you started experimenting with substances? Um, uh, like most people, I don't remember the first time I was ever in my system, but um, my fascination with knowing someday I was going to see what it was all about was hanging around relatives in Kentucky and stuff and seeing them. And I just thought they had the world by the tail, right? Sitting around drinking. And so probably about somewhere around late 14 or early 15, you know, I was able to get a hold of enough to really see. And uh, myself and three friends, we each, my older friend got us a case of Stroh's beer. And we each had our six. And I just remember, this is wonderful. You know, I got sick. Felt like crap the next day, but I just, this is great, you mm -hmm. know? It made life better, even though life was pretty good, as I just said. Right. So, if you could describe the progression of your disease. Okay. Um, when I tell my story, it's like, basically in three parts. Um, from, at the age of 19, I was blessed with a good job, and from that very first paycheck, I was a daily drinker until I crawled into the rooms, you know? Um, and those first years are fun, you think it's adventurous, you know, um, but every day it was, um, it was what my version, I guess, of what an adult did. I had earned my beers and I would race to the bar and have, you know, or the drive through and have some and then every night was a different bar there in those early years and um, eventually you find a home bar, but you just think it's fun, you know, playing darts. Uh, whatever you were doing and just eventually it of course it goes into the like the middle stage of your health is declining but you don't really realize it and your friends are moving on and you're not and you start to see that and I just became more and more dissatisfied with life. During that time period did any of your family ever say anything? Were there any consequences that you experienced? Um, I was arrested twice only unbelievable my, I mean I always like say my story is pretty boring I I I went to work bitched about it clocked out and ran to the bar you know but I had one misdemeanor disturbing the peace and then I had one DUI uh, of course my addiction led me to break many laws every day you know and as it, and as it progressed in the other substances you know I don't know what the offenses would be I'm sure there's a lot of felonies in there possession driving around with that stuff in your vehicle and Every day I was breaking the law of some kind, you know. Um, when I look back at that, I think that's one of the most poignant memories for me is how, of how selfish I was. Night after night after night, driving home under the influence. It was just like a big middle finger to the world. Like, I don't care about you, your kids, or your dreams. I need a beer, mm -hmm. right? Um, or I drive down my street today and I say thanks that all those blackouts coming home that there weren't kids in the middle of the road or something. Right, you absolutely. Know? Yeah. Um, at some point in there, I try other things. Um, alcohol, cocaine, and crack were my deal. And uh, I liked cocaine right away. Like, wow, you know? Like, where you been, you know? <laughs> um, but it wasn't too prevalent due to money or whatever in the early years. Uh, but t the end, hellish years, it was always there, right? Um, it was once you once I would reach a certain buzzed point with the with the alcohol It's like eh, we need to jack this up a little, you know, and then I get on the phone and start looking and um, But yeah, you, the, back to the question, <laughs> but did people start saying anything or um, Somehow I don't remember anybody using the word alcoholic or um, You know going to any kind of program it was just, they would say, man, you really should change your life. You know, especially my mother. Um, 
when they talk about other people can't get us sober, you know, and that, that she's my biggest example. I would just think of the hell I put her through, and, and all I would, could say is I know, because I knew deep down inside, right, that my life wasn't going anywhere, mm -hmm. but I had no clue for the solution because I had no idea what the problem was yet. I was a lot of years away from being introduced to even what the problem was, you know, to where I can understand it. So all I did was feel guilty and thirsty, yeah. you know, about right. that remorse. Right. And just mumble, uh, I know, and I'm sorry, but. Did you have um, any other family members or close friends that had, had experienced um, addiction issues or had found their way in recovery? Um, not that I'm aware of. Addiction issues, yes. Um, both of my folks are from Kentucky, right? Very rural area. And I've asked my mother um, a few times along, you know, my early years, did anybody else, you ever hear of any other family member going to meetings or anything? And she said, no. My dad passed away 11 years before I got sober. So there was never, you know, I never really talked to him about that. Right. So could you paint a picture of what those dark days were like for you at towards the end? Um, yes. Yes. The third phase. Yes. The hellish years. Um, probably five to six years, especially the last three. Um, after my family, as gently as they could, removed me. I had landed back at my mom's house as a supposed adult. Was going to take care of her after dad passed. Help, you know. I was a nuisance, man. I was doing things in that house, illegal things, and bringing some not good people in that house. That just slid into, wow, very, very dark times. Uh, hallucinating, pacing the floor, you know, um, constantly. Constantly, whenever I get my hands on it, the drugs were there too, right? So I'm missing work a lot more, a hell of a lot more. And um, the job, the potential loss of a, a, a pension was very much in my involved in my bottom, finally at uh, taking the help that was offered. But just living in a hole, you know, um, dirty, uh, missing work days at a time, um, hiding out. I'm at the bottom of a hill and I would come to the stop sign and I would look down the hill and if anybody was in my driveway I would turn and go away you know so I didn't run into my family um, I always say that I'm on a, the mailbox is on the corner I would wait and go up to the mailbox at 3 in the morning so no one would see me and I had a I got to the point where the paranoia and everything was so bad that I found a spot in the end of my hallway where I went out and checked and no one could see me and I would sit there you know, with a warm beer beside the chair and my my cocaine on the counter in the kitchen, that would be the only time I would get up, wow. just for fear of anybody seeing me, you know, the state I was in. Um, I wrote a letter to my a lot of family members, you know, kind of copied it off. And the one thing I remember the most saying is, you know, about how we're avoiding family and everything. I was afraid that if you looked me in the eye, you would know how sick I was. And so that's where I was at, just total total isolation going to work I mean just barely enough to hold on to that job you know yeah um, and basically lying to the entire world that that point where I would go to the bar and just be so careful like trying to gauge that line where I got to get out of here and go home so I can drink and drug like I need to uh -huh. you know yeah that double yeah. double face and it's such thing. a lonely miserable existence oh my god yes oh my god yes and today you know, the world is at my fingertips. Right. Um, certain phrases I just love in the literature I read, you know, we can look the world in the eye and things like that. And um, from a guy that hid for days at the end of a hallway, to be able to get in my car and just go wherever I choose, you know, yeah. without fear of temptation and all that stuff, it's amazing. Yeah. So the attendants and with the job, they say, yeah. mm -hmm. you can take this opportunity and you decided to. Um, okay, that was definitely my higher power, as we say. Mm -hmm. um, I fully believe I was prayed into the rooms, and and I always say when I'm talking about it is, no, my mom didn't sit down and say, I pray Tom gets in trouble. I pray his heart is about to explode, or the other people. But boy, they sure was praying for me to turn my life around. And my higher power knew the only way I was going to do that is to be completely cornered, 
and completely desperate, right? Um, so what happened? The what happened part of my story was, I had went on one more binge, and I had reached the point where I didn't care if I lived or died. I knew that the job was gone this time, and I just couldn't make myself care anymore. And uh, I came to from drinking everything was in the house, and uh, doing everything that was in the house, and. I laid there in bed and I started making a list of what I could sell, how long could I keep this thing going, and um, and realizing that my insurance was gone, my heart meds, you know, my heart is complete is was completely screwed up, AFib, heart congestive heart failure. Um, I've had ten heart procedures in sobriety, you know, like the paddles and ablations and. Right. I'm very blessed to even be breathing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but here's the what happened part. And I came to from all that and I made that list. And the last thing I realized was in the very near future, my family is going to have to bust down that door and find me laying in here dead. Right. And I just really didn't care anymore. So there's some something in the literature about accept spiritual help or go on to the bitter end. And my decision in that moment was to go on to the bitter end. And I went to the bar. But I walked through the door the door that day with the full intent of officially starting to drink myself to death. And there was one of my bosses. So this is just like, right? It's three in the afternoon or something. He's not even there to drink. He's getting a pizza. And he offered me help one last time. And finally, as I say, my desperation met my opportunity. Yes. Right? Uh, I had been desperate before, but... They weren't right there in my face, uh -huh. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, and I finally said yes. Um, it wasn't that that horrible feeling laying there in bed wasn't quite my last drink. The night before they were going to pick me up to take me to treatment, I went in my bar and sat on my stool one last time, and I had four glasses of beer and I ordered the fifth, and I drank about half of it, and that's where I finally said, "This is insane. Go home." So once you got into this path of recovery, mm -hmm. um, can you describe how you changed, what changed, how your relationships changed, basically how you changed your yeah. life? Yeah. Um, let's see. Treatment was awesome. I was safe. I was fed. And I was introduced to where I ultimately landed, in my 12-step program. And... Um, I say the best thing I ever did for my recovery the longer I'm sober is I went to a meeting three hours after I got home. Right? I didn't give the old crazy brain time to talk me out of it. And I was made to feel welcome. And I started meeting good people. Uh, when I walked through the door, all I wanted to do was stop hurting. That's the only thing I was barely hoping for. You know, and I've gotten so much more. But it was the people that said, get in the car. The people that said, it's your turn to put up the chairs. <laughs> you know, and all that stuff. I didn't even realize what was happening. And um, I was blessed that my family was behind me the whole time. They never they never disowned me or anything. And um, the place I was most afraid of coming home. Because in the, in the treatment, I decided I want this. Whatever the hell it is, I want it. Very cool. And it, and it is. It's about the relationships, the people... Being able to, to to really be part of and mm -hmm. yeah, yeah have that um yeah, yeah the, that feeling that comes along with one being okay with myself and being you know okay with everybody there and it's more than okay but that feeling is yeah. that contentment yeah I, my uh, my uh, gratitude and enthusiasm showing I but we might have to edit here because <laughs> I forgot a big one do okay. you mind yeah no go for it for three summers uh, eleven. Maybe four. I tried my hand at music promotion. And I brought amazing world-known blues artists to my hometown. Really? Including quite a handful who are also in recovery. Right? So to sit and talk to them about it, uh, talking with one particular gentleman over dinner about his liver transplant and being lucky to be alive. And uh, sober support, my friends were there. It was always very easy to have a meeting in between sets. Mm -hmm and to li actually live the recovery. You know, it says if I have a legitimate reason to be there, go there and have fun. Absolutely. Pretty cool, living in a rural part of Ohio that mm. maybe doesn't get some of that exposure mm -hmm. to, to, to some different types of music. That's yeah. pretty awesome. Yes. Very cool. Um, 
so you talked about relationships and you know that's a, a big theme with a lot of people that that's you know what they're most grateful for or on the among the top few um how how did you go about rebuilding the repairing those relationships with your family oh my goodness not in a negative way at all but that's where the grind of one day at a time making those amends you keep showing up when you say you're going to show up right that, and I'm still doing that. I still take that very, very serious. Um, there was a moment very early on when it really sunk in my head what I had done to my loved ones. There was a family birthday party, and I had told them I would be there. And they're just now getting used to this idea, right? Okay. And something came up. It was around a meeting and helping a new person. But I was about 45 minutes late. And I walked in, and I saw this look a relief over my mom and sister's face and that's when it truly truly sunk in how did the experience of work change for you for many years of you know an active use to to being sober at what was it like as an employee to to change for you know change and then how did how did your employment change as, as far as that goes um, complete night and day um, I was no longer the when he was there grumbling angry dude uh, not someone to avoid. Um, I showed up. That's the first part. They they came to learn that I was going to show up. And it led to things like, I eventually, for like my last, three years of the last, the plan ended up closing before I got full retirement. But I was a team leader for three years. Won by election by the folks in your area, right? Um, again, they saw the honesty. They saw the changes. Um, to to mending those fences you know there was a couple stubborn folks that thought I should not have a job at all he's just a drunk you know but that happens mm -hmm. uh, I was blessed my first sponsor worked about a minute walk away from the, across the hall the aisle way there <laughs> uh, but just complete night and day and um, and since that plant closed I worked other places and basically it's every time it's the same please don't leave right yes I yes. did that last <laughs> night it was today's a big day I, I put in my notice and I quit um, quit the little part-time job I was a little financial insecurity fear I guess you'd call it and I was holding on to a security blanket but um, last night was it I'm gonna go full time into my new pursuits my acting career and I've been training for over two years now and um, I'll probably go along <laughs> it's like I've landed on uh, a various sizes, 30 movie sets now. Done some commercials, a couple TV things, um, from five minute short films to doing background on huge Netflix productions. I've been on set with four Oscar winners so far. And I truly believe in the saying we have, what everybody else thinks of me is none of my business. And I do my darndest to live by that. Say what you may. I know my life is good today. I know I'm a good person today when I'm doing this deal. So I don't suffer from it, even if it, so I hope that made sense. Yes, absolutely. And, and to let everybody else know that is possible. That attitude is possible. And it's not a lack of caring. It's right. being able to be comfortable in your own skin. Yes. Yeah. So, so what do you do today to maintain your the life that you have built for yourself? Okay. Um, I heard a gentleman speak one time, and, and, and I try to embrace this. He said that his purpose was to help another person suffering. And that the more he embraces that purpose, the better everything else is. Uh, I would have never dreamed or picked the purpose of helping another alcoholic to be my life purpose. But the better I accept that that's what it is, and the more I have my hand out to the next person, then the better everything else is. All this enthusiasm hearing my voice today and this good life it's all because I stay willing to go sit down at, at the table across from another new guy and go through the work and uh, show up early and put the coffee on it, it's that simple I mean I I don't I never seem to come want to come across as a smart ass but when I tell my story it's like the big secret is secret you know is work some steps and help somebody that's it I, I, early on, somebody told me this is a simple program for complicated people. Absolutely. So very true. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, 
what dreams do you have for the future? I mean, you're living a pretty, pretty awesome life, but what are those kind of big dreams that you would like to, uh, to have come to be able to at, at least, let me, let me try that mm -hmm. again. What dreams do you have for the future? Well, uh, again, not to be a smart aleck, um, more of the same. Uh, I don't have any dreams of fame. Uh, I have dreams of becoming good at what I'm trying to do. And that will work it itself out. Like I just said, if I may stick to my purpose, everything else will work out. Mm -hmm. uh, having started as late in life as I did, you know, all that stuff, I never even really considered it. I'm blessed every time I step on a set or every time I'm, I sh I'm with my family. So just keep keep doing what I'm doing. I, I also always say that I'm blessed to have that purpose. That as long as I'm willing to go through that door and put on the coffee, I have a purpose. I won't end up the lonely old man sitting alone in this house. You know? So just to keep doing what I'm doing as long as I'm able. Right. Can you share some words of inspiration or hope that have spoke to you during challenging times? Um... challenging times I've had them the, the health uh, had my heart broken the plant closes out from under you that was a panic time boy like what the hell am I gonna do uh, the simple things like we said um, I was told and taught very on just one foot in front of the other and again right back to what I just said show up early make the coffee yes help somebody else right um, all those things that people say are cliche or don't make sense, uh, that's the things. Um, one of the greatest hopes I had in the early days was when somebody who had been around for a long time would look me dead in the eye and say, it just keeps getting better. And uh, I, think, I think I've come to some understanding of that is to be so much more able to accept and roll with the punches, right? I didn't get more rich or more houses or how it gets better is the dips in the road are very small now overall it's you have a remarkable story of you know the that depths of of active addiction to really this life of freedom mm -hmm. I, I mean is the the best way that i can 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 describe what i'm experiencing as part of this um is there anything we missed is there anything that you would like to share that Uh, wow. One thing I try to like like to say is, um, you know, because this, this acting thing is new to me, and I still sometimes feel like I'm bragging, but it's just my life. And so what I try to make the point of is whatever you're sitting here in this room dreaming of doing, better relationships, be a writer, a little financial security, whatever it is, it's all possible one day one step at a time but it has to start with recovery it has to start with doing the work to change how i view and react to the world you know yes and then everything else is the sky's the limit literally beautiful well thank you so much for taking time out of your you know wonderful exciting life um and being able to really be real and mm -hmm. and share your experience it um, as I said, you have a, a, a remarkable story and uh, it's going to help somebody. I surely hope so.